Hey, it's good to be back with you, and we're continuing in our series on the doctrine of God, and this session is going to focus on God's omniscience. And I just want to state from the outset that I'm of the fir firm conviction that lay people are hungry for solid meat, and that's the passion of my heart is to do my small little part that I can to help serve up a steady diet of solid meat for folks like yourself who have a passion to um, delve deeper into God's Word and to grow and to learn and to learn together. And uh, I just want you to know, there's, I, I continue learning. I study, I read, and uh, occasionally I change my mind, still, at age 62. And it, it's something that's delightful when I change my mind. So, let's talk about God's omniscience. We've talked about His, uh, his omnipotence and His omnipresence. Now, his, when we talk about His omniscience, that literally means that he knows all things and that he not only knows all things but he knows all things about all things and um, which is pretty remarkable when you think about that his knowledge is exhaustive his knowledge is what is um, technically called primary knowledge along with being exhaustive where our knowledge is limited and all of our knowledge is derivative. It comes from him. He never learns. Uh, all of his knowledge is what uh, the theologians refer to as eternally intuitive. Um, different terms for it, but he doesn't have to rely on learning. He knows all things now and always has. So, the first thing that God knows comprehensively is himself. God has exhaustive self-knowledge. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have exhaustive knowledge of each other and of, well, let's put it this way. The Father knows the Son perfectly, and the Father knows the Spirit perfectly, and the Spirit knows the Son perfectly, and the Father perfectly, and the Son knows the Father and the Spirit perfectly, and all the dynamics between them. And as I alluded to in our study in, in the Trinity, that's just a beautiful thing to contemplate, is the eternal intratarian communication and relationship between the persons of the Trinity. So, the text that I would like to turn to is Psalm 139, because after God's exhaustive knowledge of himself, is that after he created, he then has complete exhaustive knowledge of his creation, the entire cosmos. And let's look and learn more together as to what this exalted uh, concept means. Now, another word by way of introduction, we also use this text when we are um, looking at one of the other attributes of God, and we can see God's omnipresence in this text. We can see his omnipotence with reference to creation uh, in this text, as well as um, a couple other attributes of God. But the thread that holds it all together, uh, this one of beloved's psalm or Sam, if you're from um, Scotland, they uh, call the psalm Sam's. Um, is the thread that holds everything together is God's omniscience. And as we'll see, the reason why God knows all things is because He has foreordained them. But that's jumping ahead. So let's let's dig in. We're not going to read the whole thing, but portions of it. Starting at verse 1, O Lord, you have searched me 
and known me. Now notice from the very outset that David, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is applying this doctrine of God's omniscience in a very practical way, personally, the way it should be. He's applying it to himself. Oh Lord, you have searched me and you've known me. And that gives us a clear indicator from the outset and a very important reminder that all good theology is the application of Scripture to all of life. Um, and that's what I'm attempting to do. And David reminds us that this is a, an attribute of God that he delights in. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that his omniscience is good. And I want us to experience God's attribute of omniscience and to taste it, to see that his omniscience is good and that that's the highest aspect of studying these attributes of God is, is experiencing them. And it's, that's really um, the goal. It's not just to, you know, to, to grow in our head knowledge. Though it has to start there. Um, the heart cannot embrace what the head doesn't understand. Um, but then secondly, the first words out of his mouth, though, are, O Lord, or O Yahweh. And that's instructive as well. Because, do you remember our first, very first study? It was on the Lordship attributes. We noted that, as it talks about O Lord there, that it sets the context for this whole discussion of God's omniscience. And that's this, obviously, it's the Lord. And we, we noted that the Lordship attrib attributes are, are three they are control, or his, his sovereign power over his entire creation, his authority. His, the first has to do with his might. The second has to do with his right, his absolute, um, his authority to elicit absolute obligation from his creatures. Um, that which he created, he owns, and that which he owns, he has the uh, authority to uh, obligate us. So you have control, you have authority, and you have presence. And the first two highlight what theologians refer to as God's transcendence. Okay, that's God is up here. He's wholly other. He is distinct from his creation. And God's presence has to do with what is referred to as his eminence. And any good theology, biblical theology, has to hold those two together, God's transcendence and his eminence, because any false religion um, is going to uh, have an imbalance in those, uh, between those two att uh, attributes, God's transcendence and his eminence. For example, paganism accentuates the eminence of God that God is is um, in the world. In fact, what they basically uh, you can take all the countless uh, representations of paganism, and the hallmark of all of them is that they uh, deny the distinction between the Creator and the creation. So we the reason I raise this is because one of the um, discussions about God's omniscience and His knowledge. Uh, that has raged for hundreds of years is is his knowledge above space and time or is his knowledge in space and time is it a temporal and a spatial 
or does God meaningfully enter into um, his knowledge? Is it, it, does he meaningfully understand, you know, what's going on in, in our world? Or is he too far above? So my point is, is that why do we set up that the either or? Because it's both and. With God's transcendence, we are reminded that, you know, before there was a creation, God knew all things. He knew himself perfectly, but then he decided freely to, to make this finite world, right? The world is finite. God's infinite. So his transcendence reminds us that his omniscience is, is well, he's called the, the I am, Yahweh, for a reason. He's the only real being. We are becomings. The hallmark of a person is that we are changing. God is immutable. He's changeless. So um, there's one sense in which he's the only being, supreme being, and we are, we are becomings, so to speak. But we have to remember that in one sense, God is all temporal and all spatial because for him, in a very real sense, the past, the present, and the future are all present for him because he's supra temporal he's supra spatial these are concepts that are um, we can say them as and maybe conceptualize them a little bit um, it's just important that we affirm them but also God is supremely transcendent but he has graciously uh, become imminent, especially in the person and work of Christ. In the fullness of time, God entered into space and time. And he understands, he knows, because he became man, he's truly God. Jesus is uh, the God-man, he's truly God and truly man. Understands the succession of minutes and hours that we experience. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that God is not like some super computer. He's fully personal. You know, we're personal because God is ultimate person or personal. He's tri-personal. And Though he is super temporal and super spatial, he is he also has entered into space and time um, via the Holy Spirit. He the Trinity indwells believers, and his um, he also upholds all of creation moment by moment. Colossians 1, 16 and seventeen. So those theologians who emphasize the fact that God must be super temporal, or temporal, or spatial, they, they they forget the fact that you know that God very meaningfully gets down on his knees, so to speak, and in, interacts with us, and and indeed indwells us. And the, when we read this text, we'll see that that God's knowledge of us is one in which he's intimately aware of of all of our needs um, on a moment by moment basis that is that he responds to us in prayer um, uh, for example uh, he responds to our needs and um, he, he even prays for us when we don't understand or know how to pray. So hopefully I've, I've clarif clarified that enough to confuse you, <laughs> is, is to see that balance, that um, as Lord, the, the two aspects of his, his knowledge. It's the second, his imminent knowledge that we're gonna focus on because that's the way God, he, you know, he, he doesn't speak to us as a fish or as a snail because we're not fish or snails. And he can't speak to us as God would speak to God in his language because we wouldn't understand it. He speaks to us in human language because we're made in his image. And so he has graciously entered into time and space 
And that's how his omniscience is expressed in a very real way. So, in verse 2, You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. His knowledge of us is so complete that it, it, it entails incidental things that I would forget. I mean, I forgot the details of this morning when I got up out of bed, other than the fact that I'm sure I stumbled around um, <laughs> like I usually do. But his, that's how, how wonderful his knowledge is, is that it is truly exhaustive. And his knowledge of us is it's not just... Um, it's not just the fact that God has a much more capacious mind than ours. He's infinite. So in one sense, his knowledge is, um, is, a qual is qualitatively different than ours. Um, because our knowledge is finite. His is infinite. Now, there is a core, an, an analogous way of, of how we know things, um, how the way that God sees a tree or an apple is the same way that we see it. I mean, he sees it exhaustively and for, from every angle, and he knows everything about it. But his, there is a continuity uh, between God's knowledge and ours because we, we, we have been made in his image. But the point here is just simply that because God has entered into space and time, he's imminent with us, that he knows everything about us, all the smallest little incidental details of our life. And then verse 3, you search out my path, my lying down, you're acquainted with all my ways. You know, there's a Perhaps the deepest longing of the human heart is to know and be known. Isn't that true? I guess I should qualify that and say to know and be known in a safe relationship in which that knowledge won't be held against us or um, that we're secure. And through God's covenant commitment to us, uh, there's a permanent security with God. His knowledge of us is a covenantal knowledge. And, um, he sees us as being perfect in Christ, but he's also aware, he's, uh, because of his, the fact that he knows all things, He's more aware of our, for our faults, our weaknesses, our fears, our brokenness than we are. But in Christ, he sees both things. Simul used to set peccator. He sees us as being simultaneously sinful in ourselves, but perfect in Christ. And it's a perfect in Christ, which is a real Mark Cunnaman and the real you if you are in Christ. And the God's omniscience is one of the most comforting truths for a believer, but one of the most terrorizing things for an unbeliever. To stand naked before a God who knows everything about you? I don't know. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You know, as I get older, it, it seems like there's more and more times where I have trouble finishing my sentences, and the, or the word is on the tip of my tongue, and I, I can't quite get it. God does. He knows the vocabulary that I'm going to use or is trying to use. And that, again, is how complete and exhaustive, absolute, and immense is knowledge and, and personal. His knowledge is of me. And then note the protective nature of his omniscience. You hem me in, behind, and before, and lay your hand on me. 
you know, his omniscience, his all knowingness is like him tenderly putting his hand on your shoulder and protecting you. That's a lovely picture. Verse 11 where it talks about, If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. Um, it reminds me of the verse that says that, you know, in your light we see light. And it's God's word that we look to. You know, he, his, he has interpreted reality, pre-interpreted every fact of the cosmos. And it's our calling to reinterpret it accurately. And going back, I, you know, I think of um, Psalm 131 and where it says that my heart has been calmed and like a winged child. And have you ever wondered why Jesus could fall asleep in the boat in the middle of a storm? I think it's because his heart was conned like that of a winged child. He knew God's omniscience, that Abba, his father's. He knew that his father was in control of all things, and he knew that his father knew all things. And hence he could relax and not be full of anxiety and just take comfort in that and lay his weary head down and take a nap. I know that everybody listening to this has broken places. You have fears, things that you regret some perhaps terribly some fears of the future and um, just know that God's omniscience goes before you and he knows all these things and he loves you and if you're in Christ he will work all things together for your good because he's omniscient he knows all things he knows all things about you, and he loves you, and he won't reject you like some people have, who have seen your faults and have uh, expressed criticism. The single most common cause for the breakup of marriages and relationships is criticism. I know that to be true. And the thing that could cause a relationship to flourish the most is compliments. Compliments versus criticism. That's um, just an added extra. Don't worry about that. He talks in th verse 13 through 14 about how his omniscience relates to his even the knowledge of um, our prenatal situation. And how the greatest masterpiece is, is that of a, uh, the formation of a baby in his mommy's womb. My daughter, my, my daughter-in-law, but she really, she's my daughter, Brittany. She's eight months pregnant. Great with child. The first daughter. And uh, she had an appointment today. I'm waiting to find out how it went. So... It is God's personal knowledge of us in the womb. Um, it doesn't start there, but because um, His knowledge of us is prior to our existence, but it's throughout our lives. Because as you look to verse 16, it says, "Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were were written every one of them, meaning every one of our days, the days that were formed for me." when as yet there was none of them. Now, it's, um, this, and this shows several things, and, and that is that I can't help but, um, it, it talks about the fact that, that 
all of our days are ordained and that they're written in God's book, which implies that God has foreordained how long we're going to live. So I can't help but apply that to the situation in the paranormal community. Uh, one of the main um, supposed reasons why people get stuck here is because of premature death um, and how that can lead to unfinished business. And according to this text, in fact, there is no such thing as a premature death and unfinished business. When God calls somebody home, uh, it's written in his book, and when they're meant to die, they will die. So on a human level, yes, we do experience, and that's how it feels to us, and having lost four um, siblings. Uh, I know what it feels like on a human level, but in reality, as far as um, in truth, there is no such thing as a premature death, nor unfinished business. And uh, so it is God, it is the fact that God is sovereign over the future that enables him to predict the future. I'll say it again. God can predict the future because he creates the future. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. Um, but before I uh, jump into that, you know, verse 17, what is really the appropriate response to an awareness of God's omniscience. How precious to me are your thoughts of God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. And it's, uh, they are, his study or examination of God's omniscience leads to worship. And as we, we mentioned several times, that um, theology should lead to doxology. A study of God's nature should lead to worship. It did with Dave, uh, David. How precious to me are your thoughts. And I would remind you of the comment from A.W. Tozer who said that the thought that comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. The thought that comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important fact about you. I should think about that because it's, it affects our understanding of the doctrine of God, who he is, his attributes, what he's like, which includes the fact that he's omniscient, will affect everything else in our lives. So, and this is to me where, where he says, I awake, I'm still with you. It's as if David is saying, Father, I've been trying to count all your thoughts and and I'm getting sleepy. So, Father, I think I'm going to go to bed now. Good night. I know that your knowledge of me is with me while I sleep. And that your knowledge of me will be with me when I wake up. Thank you. I want to... I guess that would have been a good place to stop. But I, I need to add a couple of things because one of the things that folks have a problem with is the fact that God is sovereign. What I want to impress upon you is that the, the fact that God knows all things flows out of the fact that he has foreordained all things. God knows all things because he has foreordained all things. Uh, that comes from his sovereignty, the, the first lordship attribute, that he's in control. If God is not sovereign over every molecule in this universe, he is not God. By definition, God has to be in control of his universe. Or he's, he's not God. But yet that's the one doctrine that folks really resist. And honestly, 
um, I'm really in a minority report when it comes even to evangelicals as far as my view of God's sovereignty, um, because I have a, well, I guess you could say, as a strong view of God's sovereignty, I would just probably call it biblical. And uh, folks want to deny that God, there's more and more folks are denying that God has knowledge of the future. They're called open theists because they believe that, that if God has knowledge of the future, that that, that would then de, um, decline or take away man's free will. And, um, you know, that's, that's not the case. God not only knows the future, he for, foreordains it, but it still leaves us responsible. In fact, I would argue that it's God's foreordination of the future, which leads to his knowledge of the future, which establishes our responsibility. But let me read some, a couple of texts that show God's, the relationship between God's omniscience and his knowledge of the future. Okay, um, Reading from 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 2, uh, about my favorite king, Josiah. Um, in 1 Kings 13, there's an unnamed prophet from the southern kingdom of Judah. He comes to Jeroboam, who's a, you know, the first ruler of the northern kingdom of Israel, and he rebukes his false worship, and he says this, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name. And he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the uh, high places who made offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. 1 Kings 13, 2. Okay, now, Jeroboam reigned in approximately 931. Josiah lived 639. So this is a prophecy 300 years in advance. His name explicitly stated 300 years in advance. So the prophecy foretells an event 300 years in the future, mentioning Josiah by name, foretelling his actions. And the, pro the prophecy also implies much about Josiah's values. He's to be a champion as a true worshiper of Yahweh. The prophecy anticipates many, many human free decisions. Think of all the marriages, all the conceptions and the births in that 300 year period that would have led to Josiah and and the human responsibility and freedom uh, the name given to him and then as, as we can read in scriptures a plot that elevated him to, to kingship and and so on so there you have a clear example in scripture of God um, foretelling by name a, a pro uh, coming king, um, and the reason he could do that was because he had foreordained it. Now, <clears throat> in Scripture, let's look at, at uh, two passages in Acts which bring together God's, uh, his omniscience and his omniscience <laughs> and his uh, knowledge of the future and uh, the fact that it uh, not only doesn't um, deny man's human responsibility, but establishes it. Look at Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosening the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So there you have clearly the free actions of lawless, wicked men conjoined with the fact that God planned and foreknew in advance. He foreknew in advance because he planned it. Okay? This is called compatibilism. That God's sovereignty and human responsibility are compatible. Like Trinity, it may be a mystery, 
It's not a contradiction. They're compatible. Now, just as clear, if not more clear, is um, two chapters over in Acts, starting at verse 23. When they were released, the apostles, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, get that? Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, both whom you anointed, excuse me, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak with your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal and Signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So you have here, again, you, the God's anointed, the Lord Jesus, who, if you read the Gospel accounts, it talks about Herod and Pontius Pilate, being the ones who would put Jesus to death, but when, when you read the gospel accounts, I mean, do you see Pontius Pilate and and uh, Herod walking around like zombies, uh, as if you know God's uh, plan had turned them into automatons or something? No, not at all. They made their decisions freely. They freely chose to do what they did to Jesus without any kind of force. This is the mystery and the wonderment of God's foreordered nation. What he declares and foreordains will come to pass. His sovereign will, nothing can break that. Okay, we can break his preceptor will, and we do all the time, but his sovereign will, nobody can break that. So, but you see again the confluence, the compatibility the fact that Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, okay, put Jesus to death. But then verse 28, to do what your hand and your plan had predestined, that strong word, to take place. Okay, so again, my simple point that I'm hammering home is that God's omniscience is... He knows the future, every element of the future, because he has foreordained it. That's why he knows it. His omniscience, well, he knows it because he's God, but at the um, bottom line is that that which he has foreordained, he then knows. And those two are, are connected in Scripture. And there's just a lot of folks um, who have trouble with God's sovereignty because they wrongly think that if you affirm God's sovereignty in a strong way, that that undermines man's responsibility. But it doesn't. We just, we just saw in Scripture that it does not. And I trust that as we go through Scripture, um, that we will be open to having our minds changed and um, according to what God's Word teaches. And there's some things in Scripture that we're going to touch on that might be a little uncomfortable. And that can be a time of accelerated growth. And God's sovereignty can be, for some people, an uncomfortable notion.
Um, but we'll talk more about that uh, at a different time. But I just want to conclude our study of God's omniscience where David does. And he says in verse 23 and 24, Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. God knows all things about all things. He knows all things about you. What David is modeling for us is that as God's sons and daughters, that we should ask God to search us. Indeed, as we read his word, his divine word, He is reading us. When we read his word, he's reading us. Hebrews 4. Your word is a two-edged sword. Dividing between soul and spirit. But we ask God to search us. Which, in any other circumstance, might be terrifying for an unbeliever. But for a believer, it's something in which we all know that we're under construction. But we long to be sanctified. And there are areas in my life that I'm blind to. But because of God's omniscience, obviously he knows everything about Mark Cunneman. And... Because I want to love God, I want to grow as close in my um, sanctification and in my intimacy with God as is possible the side of heaven. And that entails asking God to search us. But, you know, again, as we've seen, God's Omniscient knowledge of us is something that, because of the fact that we are covered in the perfect righteousness of Christ, is not a terrifying thing. It's a comforting thing. God knows all things, you know, past, present, and future. And uh, praise be God for his wonderful omniscience. Heavenly Father, we do praise you as a sovereign king who is all-powerful, all-present, and all-knowing. And you are worthy of all worship. And pray in Jesus' name. Amen.